we continue with AES and uh, discussions on the internal blocks of the standard that we were discussing in the last day's class also. So, we will continue with the AES key scheduling and uh, we will discuss about the internal operations inside the key scheduling algorithm and then continue our discussions with the AES decryption function. So, we have seen how the encryption function looks like and we will try to see how the decryption function can be implemented similar to the encryption function. Okay. And then uh, discuss about implementation of the AES round on modern processors. So, I will just try to reflect on this point that is how do you essentially implement uh, AES round on modern processors. The modern processors means I mean to say that processors who's, uh, who has got more than 32 bits, okay, 32 bits or more than 32 bits. Okay. So, uh, so in the when we discuss about the AES key scheduling, so there are some objectives based upon which the key scheduling was designed. Okay, so the primary objective was efficiency. So that is, as I told you, that one of the primary design uh, requirements or rather design criteria were that uh, we had to support what is known as efficiency. So that means the implementation had to be efficient. So the objectives were as follows: that is, low working memory. That is, the memory required in order to generate round the next round key from the previous round key then the memory requirement should be low and also the performance should be good on a wide range of processes okay so that means the processors on which i mean on a wide range of uh, data data widths say for example 8 bit processors 32 bit processors more than 32 bit processors okay and the other important criteria was symmetry elimination so that is because of there is a particular there are some types of attacks which exploits the symmetricity among the round keys so essentially the we had to or the, rather the designers of AES had to eliminate symmetricity in the key scheduling. Okay? So they achieved that using a concept of round constant. So each round had a unique constant. Okay? The rest of the algorithm was similar but there was a different constant which was added in every round. So that essentially was incorporated to avoid symmetricity in the round keys. Okay? The other thing uh, which is obviously we have discussed that diffusion is a very important property. So high diffusion of cipher key was expected that is uh, I, mean, I mean I mean, whenever we introduce a certain amount of difference in the input cipher key that is the input key it is expected that the expanded key there also should be a proper amount of diffusion that means that disturbance should, to, should spread to as many bytes of the expanded key as possible. Okay, so therefore high diffusion was required. And the other important property was nonlinearity. That is, there should be a, some amount of nonlinearity in each round key generation. That is, uh, so why was nonlinearity kept? So you know that the, the, it is precisely why S boxes were kept in our uh, encryption function. That is, if nonlinearity is not there, then I am able to, if I know the input difference, then I am able to predict the output difference also, right? So that means if the key scheduling algorithm did not have any amount of nonlinearity, then given say for example the input key and a differential in the input key that means if I know that if I just take two keys and I know the exit between these two keys then I am I am able to predict what will be the next round key difference much better because I know that if I have got a linear transformation then I can predict what will be the corresponding output exit. Do you understand that? So what I am saying is this that is suppose your input has got say there is one uh, you take one x which is one of your for example one of your keys or rather denoted by say k and you take a, a corresponding related key so I call that k dash and you know the difference between these two keys okay so therefore you know what is the value of k x or k dash okay so you know the value of the difference so now if you have a linear transformation then you know that the output x or the output difference can also be found out by doing this operation right so if you know x k x or k dash then you know the corresponding output difference as well because l is a linear transformation but the same thing does not hold if instead of l we had a nonlinear transformation right so in, in order to prevent that we require that in the key scheduling algorithm also there should be some amount of nonlinearity okay so so therefore uh, looking little bit inside the key, key the key expansion of AES. So the, this is a definition that is the AES algorithm takes the cipher key that or the input key and performs a key expansion. So therefore this routine is supposed to generate a key schedule. So therefore it is supposed to generate say the first round key 
second round key, the second round key generates the third round key and so on. Okay? And there is a recursive construction actually. Why? And because you know the recursive construction is easily amenable to implementation. Right? So therefore, you generate the first round key, from there you generate the second round key, from second round key you generate the third round key and so on. Okay? So a key expansion algorithm generates a total of NB into NR plus 1 words. Why? Now what is NB? NB is the number of columns in my, in the state of my AES, right? So that is, uh, represents the number of columns. And similar, NR was used to denote the number of rounds. And there are actually NB into NR plus 1 words which are being used to, gen which are being used to store the keys. Why? Now because there is one key exerting at the input also. And after that, at the end of each round. So there are NR rounds. So which means that there are totally NR plus 1 number of key exordings to be done, right? And per key exerting, there are NB number of columns which are involved, okay? So your key expansion essentially requires that NB into NR plus 1 number of words of the keys are required to be generated from the key expansion algorithm. So your key expansion uh, has got certain steps. The steps are as follows. It has got rot word, which is a rotation word. It is just a cyclic rotation. Okay. So therefore, you take a word which is like A0, A1, A2, and A3. And if you do a rot word, then there is a cyclic permutation, which means it returns A1, A2, A3, and A0. So there is a cyclic permutation. Okay. So it's just a cyclic shift. And then you do a sub word. So sub word means nothing but the sub the application of the sub byte operation. But you do it for each of the bytes. That is, you do it for a, a1, a2, a3, and a0. You do a substitute byte for each of the bytes. Okay, and collectively I name that as subword. Okay, there is also another constant which I told you, which was supposed to eliminate symmetricity in the round keys. Okay, so what is it? It's called Rcon. That is a round constant, and the parameter pass is i by n k. So what is n k? NK is the number of columns in the key matrix. Okay, for AES 128, your NK was equal to 4. Right? For AES 192, the value of NK was equal to 6. And for AES 256, the value of, a, of NK was equal to 8. Okay? And uh, I is essentially the sort of a round number. I mean, each, each time it is being passed. And the value of Rcon I by NK is given by a 32 bit word out of which the last three bytes are essentially zero okay only the ms or rather the maximum byte or rather the maximum significant byte is being computed and the value of that is equal to x to the power of i minus 1 and what is x x is an element of gf to power 8 okay so x being an element of gf to gf to power 8 what we do is that we just calculate the subsequent powers of x okay and using powers of x, we are generating the subsequent, the next round and similarly subsequent round constants. Okay? So I will show you one working uh, for that, but just to summarize the key, key scheduling algorithm. So I divide the key scheduling algorithm into two parts. Suppose the value of nk is less than or equal to 6 and suppose the nk value is greater than 6. Okay? So therefore, when I say for AES nk is less than or equal to 6, there are two possibilities, nk is equal to 4 and nk is equal to 6. Okay? And when I talk about nk being greater than 6, I mean that nk is equal to 8. Okay? So just see how the key shielding algorithm works. It's quite simple. What it does is as follows. Okay? So therefore, uh, consider it through an example. Okay? So I, I guess if I just see this as an example, it should be better. Okay? So you have got 4 bytes in your key. So you can imagine that your round key, uh, just consider the example of AES-128 it can be easily generalized for the other AES versions also. Okay? So consider AES-128. So in your AES-128, you have got 32-bit, uh, there are four columns, right? So therefore, I can represent them as for, uh, like this. So you have got 32 bits and each of them is of 32 bits, right? Similarly, this one and this one. So there are totally, you have got 128 bits, right? So imagine that this is your input key. So in AES 128, what is the size of your key? 128 bits, right? So from here, I have to generate the next round key. That is, I have to generate the round one key. Okay? And the question is how? Right? So 
it is quite simple what you do is that imagine that what you do is like this that is you take the corresponding. So, if I number them like 0, 1, 2 and 3 you take the third third word okay, and you pass that through certain transformations. Hmm. So, the transformations are as follows you rotate that first. Okay. So, you rotate that and pass that through a sub word operation okay. and then you exhort that with something which is called an archon that is a round constant okay. and that the output of that you exhort with the 0th word okay. and the corresponding output essentially is your next word that is I want to generate the next word right. So, therefore, what I do is I require to generate subsequently I want to generate the next four words of the next round key right. So, this is how you calculate this particular part that is the first. So, I, if I number them 0, 1, 2, 3 then this becomes my index 4 so that is the fourth word ok. So, now the next thing is that how do I generate the fifth word. So, the fifth word you generate by simply taking an XOR of this word that is the previously generated word and this word ok and that is the way how you obtain the fifth word. Now, the next question is how do I generate the sixth word? The sixth word is the XOR of the fifth word and the second word ok and how do you generate the seventh word? You generate by exhorting the sixth word with the third word ok. So, that is the basic algorithm how the AES key scheduling algorithm works ok. So, now you see the uh, see this uh, pseudo code I think it should be better explained ok. So, therefore, you see uh, what it does is this that is it takes an input key. So, I have written in 4 star n k. So, in case of AES 128 this value is equal to 4. So, that is 4 into 4 means 16 ok. So, you that is so therefore, there are 16 bytes. So, therefore, the data type of this is byte. So, you take 16 bytes of the key and that you store in a word of word which is supposed to output your key scheduling ok. I mean output of your key scheduling algorithm and how many. Uh, so, therefore, you see the number of words which are there it is represented by n b multiplied with n r plus 1 why now because n r plus 1 is the number of key scheduling around I mean the number of exhortings you require to do with the key and there are n b number of columns per 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 a s key which you are exhorting ok. So, therefore, what you do is that you take the 4 i th word that is inst if, if you for example, if your initially your i is equal to 0. So, what is this value equal to key key 0, key 1, key 2 and key 3 right. So, what you do is that you just take this and you dump that into an array which is w i. So, i runs from 0, 1, 2 and 3 right. So, therefore, this what you do is that you just take the input key and you dump to the initial uh, initial addresses of your array ok. So, therefore, the, uh, what I am doing is that I am trying to make a continuous array ok. So, I am storing the entire output of the key scheduling algorithm in a linear array ok in a one dimensional array ok. So, therefore, the initial parts like w 0, w 1, w 2 and w 3 are straight away the input key which is provided ok. Subsequently, I generate w 4, w 5 and w 6 and w 7 and so on ok. So, this is a quite straightforward how you generate this part of the I mean this just that you, you take the input key and you store that in w that that is as simple as that ok. But for the subsequent parts you require to do certain operations. So, you see that if i mod n k is equal to 0. So, see so you see that when i runs like i runs from 0, 1, 2 and 3 i becomes equal to 4 ok. So, when i becomes equal to 4 then you take mod with n k it returns you 0 right. So, that is precisely when you are doing this operation that is you are taking temp ok. So, temp is equal to w i minus 1 that is the previous word and then you are doing some operations like doing a rote word and followed by a sub word ok and that you are exhorting with your round constant ok. If you do not do this I mean if i mod n k is not equal to 0 then you just take the previous word right you do not do any operation. Then what you do you just exhort that with w i minus n k. So, in our case of AES 120 I was taking the previous last fourth word right. So, that is precisely what n k stores, but for other values like when n k is equal to 6 instead of taking the fourth previous word I will take the sixth previous word ok. 
So, does that more or less clarify the algorithm? Okay, so that is precisely what you do. So, therefore, you understand that uh, this is how you do the key signaling algorithm when nk is equal to 4 and when nk is equal to 6. Okay. So, now uh, the, the other thing that I will clarify or rather talk about is how are the round constants generated. Okay. So, each round constant is a 4 byte value where the rightmost 3 bytes are always 0. Okay. Only the left byte is equal to x to the power of i minus 1 where x is an element in gf 2 power h. Okay. So, you know when I am talking about the polynomial elements of or rather the elements of gf 2 power h and they are represented as polynomials, then what does x indicate? It indicates a polynomial, right. So, uh, if I consider in a, in a decimal notation, then x would have indicated what? What would have x, I mean how could I have encoded x in x being an element in gf 2 power 8, okay. How could I have uh, denoted that? So, if I start from, I mean the right one being the LSB and the left one being the MSB, then I would have represented them as 0, 1 like this, right. So, that means this was equal to 2, right. In if I just do it like, I mean uh, keep a binary representation, then this would have, uh, this would have been denoted by the number 2, right. So, what I require is I require subsequent powers like I require to compute x power i minus 1 when i varies, okay. So, therefore, uh, i is equal to 1, you know what is the value of when i is equal to 1, it is x power 0, right. So, what is x power 0? It is 1, okay. So, therefore, when i is equal to 0, then x power i minus 1 is equal to 1, okay. So, when i is equal to 1, sorry when i is equal to 1, then x power i minus 1 is equal to 1. What about when i is equal to 2? It is x, okay. What when, what is when uh, i equal to 3? It is x square and similarly you keep on computing the powers, okay. So, you easily understand that if, so therefore, if you do like this, so basically what you are doing is that the round constants can be either obtained from a table, which means you can have a tabular sort of, you can remember it in the form of a table or you can do it by computing the corresponding multiplications in gf 2 power 8 and you remember that in gf 2 power 8 whenever there is an overflow we require to do a modulo with a reduction polynomial. So, in our case our reduction polynomial for AES is x power 8 plus x power 4 plus x power 3 plus x plus 1, okay. So, this is actually an irreducible polynomial in this field, right, now because you cannot compute factors which are inside the field, okay, as simple as that. So, what you do is if you compute the subsequent powers, it will look like this, you compute x, x square, x, x cube, x power 4, x power 5, x power 6 and so on, okay. So, I have, you know, I have stored here the 10, the 10 round constants starting from RC 1 to RC 10 and you can see in your, uh, in your binary representation, this would have been 4 zeros, 3 zeros and 1. If I compute x, then this is how I denote x, okay. So, this is, if I store in a hexadecimal, this is 0, 2 right. Similarly, uh, if I do a power this x square, this would have been this, that is in hexadecimal it is 0, 4. If I com compute this next power, it is equal to like this, that is in hexadecimal it is equal to 8. So, as actually you see that the 1 is getting shifted, right. So, what happens when after this, because you know that it cannot shift beyond this, right. So, which means that there is an overflow beyond this. So, we, we require to do a exhorting with my reduction polynomial. And you see that if you do a exhorting with the reduction polynomial, then you get ones at these positions. Why? Because this indicates x, the coefficient of x power 4, this indicates the coefficient of x cube and this indicates the coefficient of x and this indicates the constant 1, okay. And your reduction polynomial was equal to x power 8 plus x power 4 plus x power 3 plus x plus 1, okay. So, subsequently after this, again when you are computing the next power, it is just a shift of this, right. You get the one shifted here, one shifted here and so on. So, these are the constants which are called or named as the round constants, okay. So, you can either store this when you are implementing this, you can either store this in the form of a table or you can compute them. That is you can compute the powers of x and take a modular if there is an overflow, okay, right. So, what, what happens when nk greater than 6? Entire thing remains the same except for one uh, for one particular additional conditional statement, it says that if i mod n k is equal to 4, 
then you do not do the rot word, you just do a sub word that is you just take the temp and do a sub word. Okay? So, that means when will, uh, so when I am considering nk greater than 6, that is nk is equal to 8, then when shall the value of i mod nk is equal be, be, be equal to 4? So, for example, when i is equal to 4, this is equal to 0. So, therefore, this same thing happens here, right? I mean, rather when i is equal to 8, then 8 mod nk is equal to 0. So, the same thing happens here, right? But what happens when 4, when i becomes equal to 4, then you require to do an additional step. That is, you instead of doing the rot word or the exhorting with the round constant, you just do a substitute word, okay? And the other things remain the same. Okay? So, the rest of the things are precisely as what we have discussed for nk less than equal to 6, okay? So, there is an additional step that you require to take care of. So, this is an example, I mean I have given you some workouts uh, as follows, that is if I require to do a 128 bit cipher key generation, then you see that your input cipher key is for example this as stored here. So, when nk is equal to 4, you know that what you have to do the initial part you just dump from the input key, that is you take w0, w1, w2 and w3. So, what you are doing is that you are just storing from the key. So, your this that is 0, 9, cf, 4f, 3c comes straight away to your w3 and the rest of the words are just copied right into your w array so so after this your actually your key scheduling stacks right so what you do after this is that when your i becomes equal to 4 then you know that you take the previous word that is 09c f 4f 3c and since i is equal to 4 and you are considering aes 128 so 4 mod 4 is equal to 0 right so therefore you have to do those subsequent steps that is you have to do a rot word, which means you have to rotate this word. So, you see that this is a rotation of the previous word and follow that up with the substitute, that is you have to do op operate the S boxes and then exhort that with the round constant. So, what is the round constant in this case? It is 1, right. So, what you do is that you take this and you exhort this and after the exhort you get, get this and subsequently you can compute the next, next round key, okay. So, next round rather next round word, word I mean next, next word of your round key. And for the other cases, you do not do these operations, you just take this and you exhort with your wi minus nk and obtain the next word, okay. And this is how you repeat this step, okay. So, you can see that your round constant from here, it has gone to here. So, this is in hexadecimal notation, okay. So, you are storing this in hexadecimal means this is 1 and this is 2 and subsequently you will have the next round constants, okay. So, this is how your uh, expansion for, one to, uh, for a 128 bit cipher key works. For a 192-bit cipher key, you have to you just see that you are your since your i minus n k in this case will be i minus six, so you have to take the sixth previous word, okay, and do an exhorting, okay. Similarly, for your temp also, it works only when i becomes equal to six. That is, you have to do the, I mean you have to do the rot word and your sub word and your exhorting with the round constant only when the index of i becomes equal to six, okay, and not when it becomes equal to eight because the value of n k is now 6, okay. And uh, similarly for 256 bit cipher key, it works only when i is equal to 8. So, when you do an i equal to 8, you have to do these operations. But additionally, when i is equal to 12, since 12 mod 8 is what? 4. So, you have to do some other operation. That is, you do not do the rot word or the exhorting with the round constant, but you straight away do a substitute word, okay. And you exhort that with the 8 previous word, because i might, because nk is in this case equal to 8, okay. So, this is how your key expansion works and uh, so that is all about, uh, I have to talk here in this uh, about uh, AA, about the AES key scheduling. So, so summarizing, I mean whatever we have talked about, uh, about the round constructions, constructions of the AES algorithm. So, as I told you that there are essentially NR number of rounds in AES, right. So, where NR, NR can be either equal to 10, it can be equal to 12, it can be equal to 14, okay. So, uh, and, and per round, there are essentially four operations. What are the operations? There are substitute word, there is uh, shift row, we have mixed column and addition with the round key, okay. So, so if I summarize this in the form of a pseudo algorithm, this will how it look like. You take the in and you require to produce your out and the entire key you essentially have stored in the form of, uh, uh, you are stored in a linear array and I, for example, the name of the linear array is w. Okay. So, who is giving you these keys? The key scheduling algorithm. 
okay so you gave you only a small key and from there you have generated a big big key essentially okay which essentially supplies the keys per round okay so what you do is that you take this state so you see that in this case the state is denoted as 4 comma nb so i have represented this as a two dimensional array so the state is a two dimensional array of four rows and nb columns okay so four rows and nb columns so what you do is that you take the input which is your plain text and you store that into a state two dimensional array and uh, then you do an add round key with the input key so therefore you know that w 0 to n my nb minus 1 holds only the input key right so the subsequent keys are being generated by your key shielding algorithm right so what you do is that you take uh, you do an, do an add round key and the output is denoted or rather stored again in the state variable okay and then you do i mean from round 1 to round nr minus 1 you do these operations that is do a sub byte do a shift row follow that up with mix column then do an add round key with the next next key okay or the next round key so you see that i have purposefully i mean we have essentially excluded the last round key right so i mean we have excluded the last round so, uh, why because in the last round there is a small modification small change what is that this mixed column step is not there why because we discussed that in the last round if we keep a linear layer then it does not add to the security okay so unnecessary we won't keep any step because this will essentially impose a performance penalty so without pro providing me any sec extra security so we exclude that in the last round of aes encryption that means we have only the sub byte shift row and the add round key with the last round key okay and the corresponding output or rather the essentially gets its value from the final value in the state variable okay so this is how the aes encryption works okay this is summarizing this is what we do so talking about decryption you understand that each step has got a decryption function like if i talk about shift row there is an inverse shift row that is precisely from the definition of the operations itself like shifting was just doing a left shift so obviously the right shift would have been the inverse right similarly i could have done the inverse sub byte also because our substitution byte was a bijective mapping so we could have obtained the inverse also similarly mixed column also there is a i mean a, that matrix that is the 2 3 1 1 kind of matrix also has an inverse matrix in the galois fields so we can do an inverse max, ma, mixed column as well okay and add round key is a self inverse operator so the cipher transformations can be inverted and then implemented in reverse order so that is quite straightforward right so you just obtain from the input you obtain the output and you start doing going going backward you can easily obtain the plain text from the cipher text okay but what is the problem in that so you require an extra hardware to do that right or write, write a separate piece of code that is the same block essentially cannot function both as an encryption or a decryption okay so therefore the next objective that we will try to inspect uh, is that whether we can write the decryption function also similar to the encryption function okay that means i will, I will have essentially the same sequence of steps and can we do a decryption okay so so first of all just discuss i mean just just go quickly through the inverse operations you know that shift row was essentially defined we have dis discussed how shift row was defined so the inverse shift row you see is just the opposite transformation okay so if you are doing a left shift left circular shift in your shift row in your inverse shift row you require to do a right circular shift okay and the number of steps are same that is for the first row you don't shift anything for the second row you shift by one by once one byte and in the third row you shift by two bytes and in the third fourth row you shift by three bytes so you obtain an inverse s box that is also obtainable i mean i'm i'm not going into the steps but you know that inverse s box is uh, invertible you can get it straight away because of this fact that your aes s box okay your aes s box was defined as y equal to ax inverse xor with b right so that was how your aes s box was working right so in order to decrypt that is in order to obtain so this was your mapping from x to y so suppose i want from y to x that is easily obtainable obtainable because we have the inverse operator working here right so therefore uh, so this was when x was not equal to 0 and when x was equal to 0 we had y equal to b because your x inverse was 0 in that case so you see that when uh, when you essentially require to do an inverse 
you can do an inverse because you can do like this that is y x odd with b and then you take the so you bring it here and then you multiply it with a inverse okay and then you take the inverse of this operation that is you take a finite field operation inverse right is it okay so what i have done is that i have just taken y and i have exhort that with b you know you get a x inverse so we pre multiplied with a matrix a inverse and a inverse does exist because you can easily understand that a inverse exists because you remember how a was constructed a was constructed by taking one zero one matrix i mean zero one vector and then cyclically we, we shifted that cyclically right so that means that all the rows essentially were linearly independent Okay, and that means that we had a full rank matrix, and therefore the inverse of that matrix exists. Okay, and therefore a inverse, if we pre-multiply and then take a finite field inverse, then we can obtain back x. Okay, so therefore the AES S box really is an invertible mapping. Okay, we already saw that its input and output were the same. That is, we have the same number of bits, but still it's a permutation, right? So therefore, if you know the AES S box from there, you can con compute or rather store or find out the input table as well or the, the inverse table as well okay and the inverse s box table looks like this that is it is stored here and you can check that whether it's really an inverse or not okay similarly the inverse mixed column is also computable but the elements are not as simple as 2 3 1 1 we had for mixed column so you have little slightly complicated elements and all the elements are in finite fields like in gf 2 power 8 so what are the elements you have, you have 0 e, you have 0 9, 0 d and 0 b. So you see that you can also find store this in the form of a matrix multiplied with a vector, right. So you can do this operation similar to your mixed column operation, but only you have slightly more complicated multiplications to do, okay. And that is one of the reason why your inverse in AES is actually, I mean it performs poorer compared to your encryption, okay. Encryption is much more optimized and but much better in terms of implementation. So therefore, uh, the algorithm of decryption process, if I just do a straightforward thing, it would have been this. That is, you take your input, store it, and then you do an add round key with the last round key, right? And then you follow that up with your inverse shift row, inverse sub byte, add round key, and inverse mixed column. So you see that this ordering of the operations are essentially changed, right? Even if I have designed these blocks, I cannot, I, I mean, I mean, I require a completely different piece of hardware to do the decryption. Right, compared to your encryption, right? So therefore, we will see that whether we can do certain amount of tweaking in the AES, or rather, try to ex exploit any properties in these transformations and implement the decryption quite similar to the encryption function. Okay. So there are two observations that we make. So you see that the order of inverse shift row and inverse sub byte is actually indifferent. It doesn't matter in which you do, right? Why? Can you can you see it? Why? Because the inverse shift row what you are doing you are just taking it's a i mean it's not a it's not taking place among the bytes okay right, right. rather it's taking place among the bytes but your inverse sub byte is a bytewise operation do you see what i'm trying to say that is what do you so suppose what do you do in, so what do you do here what you do is that you do an inverse shift row and follow that up with a sub byte operation and you do it in the other way around that is you do an inverse sub byte and then do an inverse shift row both of them are exactly the same. Why? So you see wha what you are doing here. Let us consider a simple state matrix diagram. So what do you do here? Suppose I just do the inverse shift row, right? So what you do here is that you take, okay, you take uh, the, f the, first, the first row does not shift. What about the second row? It shifts circularly to the right, okay, by one by one byte, okay, and the, this row shifts by two blocks, and this one by three blocks, okay, to the right, and that you follow by an inverse sub byte operation, which means what you do is that consider, say for example, this shaded block, okay. So in an inverse sub, sub when you are doing an inverse shift row, then where where will this get shifted to? It will get shifted to one place to the right, right. So it will come here, right? Is that okay? So what about your inverse sub, sub byte? So what happens if you do an inverse sub byte here?
So, here you look into the S box table and the output of that is stored in this corresponding byte location, right. So, therefore, if this value was equal to x, here you get x and here you get s of x, right. Maybe it is not so visible. So, it is actually equal to s of x, right. So, what if you do in the other way around? I mean, what you do is next is that you take this word, rather you take the state matrix and you consider this element and suppose this value is x, okay. You do a sub inverse sub byte that means here you have okay so i call it inverse sub byte so you have got is x okay and then you do a inverse shift row so that means this block or rather this byte moves to this location right and here you have got isx so you see that this and this are exactly the same right so that means that if you do if you commute these two operations, it is permissible. That is, I do an inverse shift row and then follow it by an inverse sub byte. It is the same thing as doing an inverse sub byte and then follow that with an inverse shift row operation. Okay? That is one observation that we make. Now, what about the last point? The last point says that the order of add round key and inverse mixed columns can also be inverted if the round key is adapted or adapted accordingly. So, this is actually not so straightforward. So, what it says is that the order of the add round key and the inverse mixed columns can also be swapped, right. So, this probably we can understand if we do this small experiment. That is, what we do is this that is, you take x, you exhort that with k, so that is your add round key, and in your when you are doing your mixed column, you are you are or, or, or an inverse mixed column that is also linear transformation, right. So, which means that you take l and you obtain l x xor k. The question is can you swap these two operations that is can you do the L first and then follow it with the XOR operation right. So, you see that your L operator you can actually push through your XOR operator why and because when you push it back you get your L but you require to do a similar transformation on your key as well that means what you require to do is that in order to obtain the same output L X XOR K that is equal to L X XOR with L K right. So, that means your x gets transformed with l and your k also gets transformed with l. So, you get, so we need that if you want to push back your l, then you require to do a similar modification or adaptation on your key as well, right. So, keeping these two things uh, in mind, we just run through a two round AES variant, okay. So, you see that the things that you have would have done in, suppose your AES in, in case of instead of being 120, uh, instead of being a 120 bits, I mean a 10 round cipher, suppose I consider a 2 round AES cipher, okay. So, what would have been, so therefore, when I consider, say that I have a 2 round AES cipher means that the first round has got all the 4 steps, but the last round does not have a mixed column operation. So, the second round in this case does not have a mixed round step, okay. So, what are the operations for a 2 round variant? These are as follows. You see that you have got an add round key, then follow that with a sub byte then a shift row, mixed column, again an add round key, but now you have a sub byte, shift row, but no mixed column and you have got an add round key. So, this is just a two round variant of AES, okay. So, what would have been the straightforward decryption of this? A straightforward decryption would have been like this. You take the second key first, follow that up with inverse shift row, inverse sub byte, again an add round key, inverse mixed column, inverse shift row, inverse sub byte and add round key, okay. So, now, I mean the, based upon the observation that we do, we know that we can actually swap these two, these two operations, right. So, we can bring this up and bring this down, right. Similarly, we can also swap these two operations, okay, with a slight change to your expanded key, right. So, if you do the these two operations, then what you will get is this, that is you do an add round key and you see that we have swapped these two steps, we have swapped this and therefore, we have actually instead of writing expanded key, we have written here equivalent expanded key. So, basically it is just a simple multiplication with your inverse mixed column matrix, okay. And similarly in this case also you see that the last round had a shift row sub byte, 
and we are actually made we have actually made it sub inverse sub byte inverse shift row. So we have also swapped these two steps. We do not require any swapping here because there is no mixed column in the last step, and therefore this actually depend remains expanded key. Okay. So now you see that this sequence of operations is exactly the same as that we are done for the encryption function. So we also had a add round key sub byte shift row mixed column add round key sub byte shift row and an add round key okay so therefore the sequencing of the steps are exactly the same okay but you require to do two modifications that is you require to find out instead of the expanded key you require to find out the equivalent key schedule output right which means you require to do a small amount of change in the key scheduling function but the rest of the things are more or less the same So, in, so the equivalent key scheduling can be obtained by applying inverse mixed columns after the key scheduling algorithm. This can be generalized to the full round AES. So you see that the same logic can be extended to the full round AES as well. Thus we see that in the equivalent decryption, the sequence of steps is similar and this actually helps in implementation. Okay. So as I told you that throughout the designers of AES had kept an objective that they wanted to make the implementation easy okay. and that is one of the prime reasons why AES became the AES. Okay. So talking about implementations, we will slightly uh, conclude our talk with uh, reflection about how do you implement an AES algorithm on modern process. So suppose I tell you that okay, write a code which is quite optimized in today's processes. So the first thing that we will probably try to do is just do a normal functional coding. Like I take the algorithm, I know how to write a piece of C code for example, I describe that in that fashion. Okay. But there is a problem as I told you that intuition is an overhead right so therefore our implementations also should be good which means that it should be fast and at the same time it should be essentially resistant against a certain uh, class of attacks which we call side chain attacks that is for example there are class of attacks which tries to exploit the amount of timing that is required by an AES function for example that is suppose for a zero key I suppose I mean for two keys I require two different timings okay then immediately an attacker can from the timing he can try to understand whether the key was say k1 or k2 okay so you have to make it timing resistant as well so there are a lot of i mean when you are designing or rather writing a software routine no, i'm not talking about the hardware aspect also then also you require to take off take care of so many other factors apart from the fact that your code has to be functionally correct you have to also take care of other factors as well okay you take care of the security you have to take care of the i mean the implementation also okay so I'll just try to talk about a small aspect on that. That is, I will try to see that how can we essentially derive a fast implementation on processors whose word length is 32 or even greater. Okay. So actually, this is how I call it. So AES served on the tables. Okay. So therefore, in order to make your AES computation fast, what we try to do is that we try to implement, or rather, we try to uh, write the AES round transformations in the form of a table. Okay. And since table lookup is quite fast actually in software, therefore this implementation is supposed to be working much faster. Okay. So what you do is this, that is suppose let the input of your round transformation be denoted by A and the output of your sub bytes by B, then you know that what I do is that I given the value of A, I look up into the S box, so I denote that by S Rindal, S R D, that is the S box of the Rindal algorithm and I obtain the corresponding output B. Okay. And you see that i comma j essentially means that this is the row index and the column index of your matrix. Okay, so your row index runs from zero to four, whereas your column index runs from zero to n b. It's actually zero to three and zero to n b minus one. Okay, and you obtain your S box output. The next step that you do is a mix. I mean, so is a is a shift row. So here we have stored like b zero comma j plus c zero. Similarly, b uh, so therefore zero one two three these are the row numbers. And the column numbers are indicated by j plus c0, j plus c1, j plus c2, and j plus c3. So this is to accommodate your shift row operation, right? So you, you know that c0 is equal to 0, your c1 is equal to 1, c2 is equal to 2, and c3 is equal to 3. So actually, when you are doing an addition operation on your index, then obviously you know you have to, to do a modular operation also. That means you have to bring it back to your state. I mean, the the the, the total data width that you have got right so therefore you cannot go beyond 3 for example okay. so what you do is that you just store them so this is your 
and the output of your shift row you store them in this corresponding vector form c0 c0j c1j and c2j and c3j and your mixed column output you stored this in a similar matrix denoted by the variable d and this is your mixed column matrix right so now when you combine all these operations you would get this right so therefore this is how when we when we combine all the operations together okay and therefore you see that each of these vectors you can represent as a linear combination of four table lookups you see that so you have got one table here second table here third table here and fourth table here and that's that's the way how you derive the entire all the four bytes that is you derive the entire column and what is the width of one column it is 32 bits right so therefore if i stored them in the form of a table each table would be like this so you have got i denote them by t0 t1 t2 and t3 so each of the elements in the table will have how many elements will have 256 elements because a is actually a byte okay and how many elements and, and i mean what is the width what is the width of each table it is 32 bits so there are 256 entries each of 32 bits so what is the total size of one table it is actually equal to 1 kilobyte right because you have got 256 entries and each of them are of 32 32 bits right so you can see that it will work to 2 power 10 2 power 8 multiplied with 2 power 2 okay so it's actually equal to 1 kilobyte and you will find that each table requires 1 kilobyte of storage okay so now if you have got four tables you would have required 4 kilobytes of table okay but one observation you can see that you can actually if you allow some additional simple operation that means uh, for example rotation then the four tables you can squeeze, uh, squeeze into one table you can reduce them into one table because you see that all the tables are nothing but rotations of each other okay so therefore if you allow cyclic rotations then instead of having a 4 kilobyte storage you can reduce it to 1 kilobytes okay so therefore there is always a cost that you need to pay okay so that depends upon what is your objective right so note that the final round does not have a mixed column step that means in the first final round we just have a sub byte lookup we don't have a mixed column operation okay so further readings you can do from this book by Douglas Pinson and there is actually the book from which I have taken certain excerpts is written by Damon and Ryman themselves it is called the design of Rindal but this book, book is really not so freely available so you can look into this book okay so this is this gives you a quite quite nice detailing okay so some exercises that is first of all you convince yourself that the diffusion in AES takes place very fast okay that is what you do is that you require to sort of reason out that how many rounds are necessary for a one byte diffusion to spread to the entire AES state matrix okay so therefore this is given you to an exercise but not you are not supposed to submit but at least you can work at your own place okay so just see that how many rounds are necessary for a one byte diffusion to spread to the entire AES state matrix okay so you can just take it as an example and really appreciate the fact that the AES diffusion is quite fast okay so but before I conclude I will just try to reflect because I had some questions that is how are the number of rounds of a cipher being fixed okay so although we have not really talked about cryptanalysis but i will just conclude with an idea for that okay see for example i i actually give an answer to the previous exercise actually we will see that in aes 128 two rounds are sufficient to provide you full diffusion which means that one byte of the input will affect i mean if you just consider two rounds of aes the each output bit will be essentially will be a function of all the input bits two rounds previous okay so that means that you obtain full diffusion in two rounds okay so actually uh, people have found out that six rounds of aes 128 has got shortcut attacks which means that there are attacks which are better than an exhaustive search okay so as a conservative approach it was thought that okay we will keep two rounds of diffusion at the beginning and two rounds of diffusion at the end okay so you have got six rounds of aes 128 so as a safeguard you give keep two rounds at the beginning and two rounds at the end so these two rounds are supposed to provide you full diffusion okay so so it was thought that okay if i obviously i wouldn't have kept six rounds i required more than six rounds because we have attacks for six rounds okay 
So what we do is that we keep two rounds at the beginning and two rounds at the end, and totally we have got ten rounds for AGF one twenty. Okay, but for the other variant, that is when when the number of rounds increase by one for every, so we have seen that for every thirty two bits of additional key, we have actually increased the number of rounds by one. Right? See, for example, in AGF one ninety two, we had a thirty two bit increase. We had increased the number of so how many bits we, uh, were in, and what is the difference from between one ninety two and uh, 128 64 so there are 232 bits right and we have increased the number of rounds by 2 similarly for 256 we have again increased it by 2 why now because you see that although you are actually giving large number of keys means you are basically providing an additional guarantee of security so what you are saying is that if aes 192 is really secure secured then there are no shortcut attacks against aes 192 okay which means that there is no attack which is better than a 2 power 192 search okay so the main reason is that we need to avoid shortcut attacks since with the increase in key size the exhaustive key search grows exponentially the shortcut attacks will work for larger number of rounds than for aes 128 so what the last li lines mean is that suppose we have an we have attacks for 6 round aes 128 okay so therefore it's quite likely that actually you will have if you if you use similar kind of properties then you will have actually attacks for maybe seven rounds of aes 192 why now because when you when i'm talking about an attack better than a shortcut attack means what means that i am guaranteed that there is a, there is there should be an attack which is better than 2 power 192 okay so when i'm saying that okay six rounds of aes can be attacked which means that there are attacks which are better than 2 power 128 right but when i'm saying that okay for seven rounds of aes 128 there are no attacks better than a short, shortcut attack which means that i can devise an attack which has got a complexity or workforce more than 2 power 128 right so it can be for example 2 power 150 but 2 power 150 for aes 192 would be considered an attack you see that so therefore actually for aes 192 i require larger number of rounds okay similarly if you consider data words you will if you consider data words like if you expand the data words you know the rindal you can actually expand the data words also that is from 128 you can have 192 data you can process on one to, uh, on 256 bit blocks as well right so for these kind of ciphers that is which are actually not aes but rindal to be more particular so in those cases your diffusion is actually quite slow that you can see that for 192 maybe you will see that your diffusion takes place in three rounds and not in two rounds so which means what what that means that you have to provide extra number of rounds okay so that is precisely the reason why aes 192 or aes 256 or rindal algorithms which work on larger data sizes or rather larger blocks of plain text actually requires more number of rounds than aes 128 okay so actually aes 128 i mean if i just summarize i mean is i mean still considered to be a more secured algorithm compared to aes 192 or aes 256 okay and actually in crypto this year there has been a paper which cryptanalyzes aes 192 and aes 256 okay so there people have been actually able to find out ways better than doing a 2 power 192 tries and 2 power 128 tries using trials using uh, i mean for aes 192 and aes 256 but aes 128 is still an open problem okay so people have actually combined various kinds of attack strategies like linear cryptanalysis differential cryptanalysis related key attacks there are some attacks called boomerang attacks okay there are some attacks called square attacks slide attacks and so on so people have actually devised lot of kind of attacks and they try to find out okay through which i mean i mean i mean you have to basically choose some something of this and something of the other and tailor out an uh, a really good attack on a cipher okay so we will actually talk in the next day's class on some of on one such class of attacks it's called linear cryptanalysis okay so we just discuss about how linear cryptanalysis works against block ciphers